Welcome back. I'm wearing my other, I have several Mockingbird shirts. It's a little bit obscene, but it is what it is. You saw this one in chapter five too, I think. Uh, chapter six, we left off chapter five. Uh, the, there was a long conversation between Miss Maudie and Scout about kind of the background of Boo Radley. We got a little different perspective on that. Uh, and the kids are playing the Radley game. No, actually, the kids try to give uh, Boo a note, and they get caught, and Atticus yells at them. Uh, chapter six. Here we go. <clears throat> yes, said our father, when Jem asked him if we could go over and sit by Miss Rachel's fish pool with Dill, as this was Dill's last night in Maycomb. Tell him so long for me, and we'll see him next summer. We leaped over the low wall that separated Miss Rachel's yard from our driveway. Jem whistled Bob White, and Dill answered in the darkness. Not a breath blowing, said Jem. Look at yonder. He pointed to the east. A gigantic moon was rising behind Miss Maudie's pecan trees. That makes it seem hotter, he said. Frost in it tonight, asked Dill, not looking up. He was constructing a cigarette from a newspaper and string. No, just the lady. Don't like that thing, Dill. You'll stink up the whole this whole end of town. There was a lady in the moon in makeup. She sat in her dresser, combing her hair. We're going to miss you, boy, I said. Reckon we better watch for Mr. Avery. Now, this is funny. See if you can figure this out. Mr. Avery lived across the street from Mrs. Henry Lafayette DeBose's house. Besides making change in the collection plate every Sunday, Mr. Avery sat on the porch every night until 9 o'clock and sneezed. One evening, we were privileged to witness a performance by him, which seemed which seemed to have been positively his last, for he never did it again so long as we watched. Jim and I were leaving Miss Rachel's front steps one night when Dill stopped us. Golly, look yonder! He pointed across the street. At first we saw nothing but a kudzu-covered front porch, but a closer inspection revealed an arc of water descending from the leaves and splashing into the yellow circle of the streetlight, some ten feet from the source, source to earth, it seemed to us. Jem said Mr. Avery misfigured. Dill said he must drink a gallon a day, and the ensuing contest to determine relative distances and respective prowess only made me feel left out again as I was untalented in this area. Okay, first of all, pause. What is Mr. Avery doing? An arc of water descending from the leaves, splashing into the circle of light some 10 feet from the source to earth. He's peeing. That's what Mr. Avery's doing. He's peeing. And they were amazed at the distance. Ten feet is kind of a lot of feet for the peeing thing, I would imagine. I also am a talented in that area. But then it says, the contest to determine relative distance made Scout feel left out. Why? Because she can't pee for distance. We don't pee for distance, girls. So that was funny. Dill stretched and yawned and said altogether too casually, I know what, let's go for a walk. He sounded fishy to me. Nobody in Makeham just went for a walk. Where to, Dill? Dill jerked his head in a southerly direction. Jem said, okay. When I protested, he said sweetly, you don't have to come along, Angel May. You don't have to go, remember? Jem was not one to dwell on past defeats. It seemed the only message she got from Atticus was insight into the art of cross-examination. Scout, we ain't going to do anything. We're just going to go to the street light and back. Street light and back. We strolled silently down the sidewalk, listening to the porch swings creak, creaking with the weight of the neighborhood, listening to the soft night murmurs of the grown people on our street. Occasionally, we heard Miss Stephanie Crawford laugh. Well, said Dill. Okay, said Jem. Why don't you go on home, Scout? What are you going to do? Dill and Jem were simply going to peep in the windows with the loose shutter and see if they could get a look at Boo Radley. And they... And if I didn't want to go with them, I could go straight home and keep my fat flopping mouth shut. That was all. But what in the Sam Holy Hill did you wait till tonight? Scout said. Because nobody could see them at night. Because Atticus would be so deep in a book he wouldn't hear the kingdom coming. And because if Boo Radley killed them, they'd miss school instead of vacation. And because it was easier to see inside a dark house in the dark than in the daytime. Did I understand? Jem, please. Scout, I am telling you for the last time, shut your trap or go home. I declare to the Lord, you are getting more like a girl every day. A little bit of sexism, a little bit of stereotyping. With that, I had no option but to join them. We thought it was better to go under the high wire fence at the rear of the Radley lot. We stood less of a chance of being seen. 
The fence enclosed a large garden and a narrow wooden outhouse. Jem held up the bottom wire and motioned Dill under it. I followed and held up the wire for Jem. It was a tight squeeze for him. Don't make a sound, he whispered. Don't get in a row of collards. Whatever you do, they'll wake the dead. With this thought in mind, I made perhaps one step per minute. Notice the slow motion pacing here. I moved faster when I saw Jem far ahead beckoning in the moonlight. We came to the gate that divided the yard from the, the garden from the backyard. Jem touched it. The gate squeaked. Spit on it, whispered Dill. You've got us in a box, Jem, I muttered. We can't get out of here so easy. Shh, spit on it, Scout. We spat ourselves dry and Jem opened the gate, slowly lifting it aside and resting it on the fence. We were in the backyard. The back of the Radley house was less inviting than the front. A ramshackle porch ran the width of the house. There were two doors and two dark windows between the doors. Instead of a column, a rough two by four supported one end of the roof. An old Franklin stove sat in the corner of the porch. Above it, a hat rack mirror caught the moon and shone eerily. Ah, Jem said, softly lifting his foot. What's the matter? Chickens, he breathed. That we would be obliged to dodge the unseen from all directions was confirmed when Dill, went at, when Dill ahead of us spelled G-O-D in a whisper. We crept to the side of the house, around to the window with the hanging shutter. The sill was several inches taller than Jem. I'll give you a hand up, muttered Dill. Wait, though. Jem grabbed his left wrist and my right wrist. I grabbed my left wrist and Jem's right wrist. You know that cross thing? We crouched and Dill sat on our saddle. We raised him and he caught the windowsill. Hurry, Jim whispered. We can't last much longer. Dill punched my shoulder when we lowered him to the ground. What'd you see? Nothing. Curtains. There's a teeny tiny light way off somewhere, though. Let's get away from here, breathed Jim. Let's go around back again. Shh, he warned me as I was about to protest. Let's try the back window. Dill, no, I said. Dill stopped and let Jem go ahead. When Jem put his foot on the bottom step, the step squeaked. Notice how slow motion this is right now. Every motion. Jem stood still. He then, then he tried his weight by degrees. The step was silent. Jem skipped two steps, put his foot on the porch, heaved himself to it and teetered in a long moment. He regained his balance and dropped to his knees. He crawled to the window, raised his head and looked in. Then I saw the shadow. It was the shadow of a man with a hat on. At first I thought it was a tree, but there was no wind blowing and tree trunks never walked. The back porch was bathed in moonlight. The shadow, crisp as toast, moved across the porch toward Jem. Dill saw it next. He put his hands to his face. When it crossed Jem, Jem saw it. He put his arms over his head and went rigid. The shadow stopped for about a foot beyond Jem. Its arm came out from its side, dropped, and was still. Then it turned and moved back across Jem, walked along the porch and off the side of the house, returning as it had come. Jem leaped off the porch and galloped toward us. He flung open the gate, danced still and me through, and shoot us between two rows of swishing collards. Halfway through the collards, I tripped. As I tripped, the roar of a shotgun shattered the neighborhood. Dill and Jem dived beside me. Jem's breath came in sobs. Fence, by the schoolyard, hurry, scout! Jem held the bottom wire. Dill and I rolled through and were halfway to the shelter of the schoolyard, solitary oak, when we sensed that Jem was not with us. We ran back and found him struggling in the fence, kicking his pants off to get loose. He ran to the oak tree in his boxer shorts. Safely behind, we gave way to, we gave way to numbness, but Jem's mind was racing. We got to get home. They'll miss us. We ran across the schoolyard, crawled under the fence to deer's pasture behind our house, climbed our back fence, and we were at the back steps before Jem let us pause to rest. Respiration normal, the three of us strolled as casually as we could to the front yard. We looked down the street and saw a circle of neighbors at the Radley front gate. We better go down there, Jem said. They'll think it funny if we don't show up. Mr. Nathan Bradley was standing inside his gate, a shotgun broken across his arm. Atticus was standing beside Miss Maudie and Miss Stephanie Crawford. Miss Rachel and Mr. Avery were nearby. None of them saw us come up. We eased in behind Miss, beside Miss Maudie, who looked around. Where were you all? Didn't you hear the commotion? What happened? asked Jem. Mr. Radley shot at, an, at a Negro in his collar patch. 
Oh, did he hit him? No, said Miss Stephanie. Shot in the air. Scared him pale, though. Says if anybody sees a white nigger around, that's the one. Says he's got the other barrel waiting for the next sound he hears in that patch. And the next time he won't aim high, be it dog or Jem Finch. Ma'am, asked Jem. Atticus spoke. Uh, where are your pants, son? Pants, sir? Pants, said Atticus. It was no use. In his shorts before God and everybody. I sighed. Uh, Mr. Finch? In the glare from the streetlight, I could see Dill hatching one. Okay. <clears throat> hatching one means he's creating a story. He's creating an excuse. In the glare from the streetlight, I could see Dill hatching one. His eyes widened and his fat chair of face grew rounder. What is it, Dill? asked Atticus. Uh, I want his pants from him, he said vaguely. vaguely. Won them? How? said Atticus. Dill's hands on the back of his head. He brought it forward and across his forehead. We were playing strip poker up yonder by the fish pool, he said. Jem and I relaxed. The neighbors seemed satisfied. They all stiffened. But what was strip poker? We had no chance to find out. Miss Rachel went off like the town fire siren. Do Jesus Dill Harris gambling by my fish pool? I'll strip poker you. Atticus saved Dill from immediate dismemberment. Just a minute, Miss Rachel, he said. I've never heard of them doing that before. Were you all playing cards? Jem fielded Dill's fly with his eyes shut. No, sir, just with matches. I admired my brother. Matches were dangerous, but cards were fatal. Okay, so let me explain this to you so you get this because it's super, it's super cool. So they obviously were not where they were supposed to be. So Dill lies and says, oh, we were playing strip poker. And the kids are like, whew. And Scout's like, what the hell is strip poker? I don't even know what that is, right? And then Miss Rachel is like, oh my God, you children were gambling? We're in Alabama, in the South, Bible Belt. You don't gamble. Gambling means you're going to hell, especially, and if you're a child and you're gambling, you're going to hell earlier. So it's like a cardinal sin. So Jim, or so Dill says, we were playing strip poker. So then the next line, which I love it, it says, uh, Atticus says, were you all playing with cards? And Jem says, the next line is, Jem fielded Dill's fly with his eyes shut. Meaning Jem is like, oh, I got it now. I got it. I know what we're going to say next. I know how to get us out of this. It's an easy fly ball. I got it. Are you ready? And then he says, no, we were playing with matches. And if you went, how do you play strip poker with matches? That's exactly the point. You can't. So they weren't really playing strip poker. They, were, they weren't really gambling. They were messing around or whatever. No, granted, they weren't doing any of this, right? But that's the excuse that they give them. So when Scout says cards, are, matches were dangerous, but cards were fatal, meaning we were playing with matches, that'll get us in trouble. But if we were gambling, we're in big trouble. Make sense? Jim, Scout said, Atticus, I don't want to hear it of poker in any form. Go buy deals and get your pants, Jim. Settle it yourselves. Don't worry. Dill, said Jem, as we trotted up the sidewalk. She ain't going to get you. He'll talk her out of that. That was fast thinking, son. Listen, you hear? We stopped and heard Atticus's voice. It's not serious. They all go through it, Miss Rachel. Dill was comforted, but Jem and I weren't. There was the problem of Jem showing up some, with some pants in the morning. I'd give you some of mine, said Dill, as we came to Miss Rachel's steps. Jem said he couldn't get in, get in them, but thanks anyway. We said goodbye and Dill went inside to the house. He evidently remembered he was engaged to me for he ran back out and kissed me swiftly in front of Jem. Y'all right, you hear? He bawled after us. Little third grade romance, so cute. Had Jem's pants been safely on him, we would not have slept much anyway. Every night sound I heard from my cot on the back porch was magnified threefold. Every scratch of feet on gravel was Boo Radley seeking revenge. Every passing Negro laughing in the night was Boo Radley loose and after us. Insects splashing against the screen were Boo Radley's insane fingers picking the wire to pieces. The chinaberry trees were malignant, hovering, alive. I lingered between sleep and wakefulness until I heard Jim murmur. That kind of reminds me of like, you know, when you're home by yourself and every noise freaks you out. That's where they are. Uh, are you asleep, little three eyes, said Jim. Are you crazy, said Scout. I said, shh, Atticus is light out. Lights out, said Jem. In the waning moonlight, I saw Jem swing to his feet to the floor. 
I'm going after him, Jem said. I sat upright. You can't. I won't let you. He was struggling into his shirt. I've got to go, he said. You do and I'll wake up Atticus. You do and I'll kill you, said Jem. I pulled him down beside me on the cot. I tried to reason with him. Mr. Nathan's going to find them in the morning, Jem. He knows you lost him. When he shows him to Atticus, it'll be pretty bad. That's all there is to it. Go back to bed. That's what I know, said Jem. That's why I'm going after him. I began to feel sick. Going back to that place by himself, I remembered Miss Stephanie. Mr. Nathan had the other barrel waiting for the next sound he heard. Be it nigger, dog. Jem knew that better than I. I was desperate. Look, it ain't worth it, Jem. A lickin' hurts, but it doesn't last. You'll get your head shot off. Jem, please. He blew out his breath patiently. I, it's like this, Scout, he muttered. Atticus ain't never whipped me since I can remember, and I want to keep it that way. This was a thought. It seemed that Atticus threatened us every other day. You mean he's never caught you in anything? Maybe so. Maybe so. But I just want to keep it that way, Scout. We shouldn't have done that tonight. It was then, I suppose, that Jem and I first began to part company. That's an important line. It was then that I suppose that Jem and I first began to part company. This is adult scout looking back at this incident and saying, this is when Jem was older and I was younger. This is when I look back and I see that he understood things on a level that I did not. It was then I suppose that Jem and I first began to part company. Sometimes I did not understand it, but my periods of bewilderment were short lived. This was beyond me. Please, I pleaded. Can't you just think about it for a minute? By yourself on that place? Shut up, Jem said. It's not like he'd never speak to you again or something. I'm going to wake him up, Jem. I swear I am. Jem grabbed me by my pajama collar and wrenched it tight. And I'm going with you, I choked. No, you ain't. You'll just make noise. It was no use. I unlatched the back door and held it while he crept down the stairs. It must have been two o'clock in the morning. The moon was settling. The moon was setting and the latticework shadows were fading into fuzzy nothingness. Jem's white shirl dipped and bobbed like a small ghost, dancing away to escape the coming morning. A faint breeze stirred and cooled the sweat running down my sides. He went the back way through Deer's pasture, across the schoolyard, around to the fence. I thought at least that was the way he was headed. It would take longer, so it was not time to worry yet. I waited until it was time to worry and listened for Mr. Radley's shotgun. Then I thought I heard the back fence squeak. It was wishful thinking. Then I heard Atticus cough. I held my breath. Sometimes when we made midnight pilgrimage to the bathroom, we would find him reading. He said he often woke up during the night, checked on us, and read himself back to sleep. I waited for his light to go on, straining my eyes to see it flood the hall. It stayed off. I breathed again. The night crawlers had retired, but ripe china berries drummed on the roof when the wind stirred, and the darkness was desolate with the barking of dogs, of distant dogs. There he was, returning to me. His white shirt bobbed over the back fence and slowly grew larger. He came up the back steps, latched the door behind him, and sat down on his cot. Wordlessly, he held up his pants. He lay down, and for a while I heard his cot trembling. Soon he was still. I did not hear him stir again. Uh, two things to point out. The end of that chapter about his cot trembling when he comes back. Just remember that. Um, and second thing, Jem doesn't go back because, uh, you know, he has to have his pants. Um, he goes back because he is afraid of disappointing Atticus. Um, you know, sometimes it's one thing when your parents get really mad at you. But when that trusted adult in your life, whether that's a parent or a teacher or whoever, when they express their disappointment with you, to you, like that they're disappointed in you, that's even more powerful sometimes than a physical punishment. And that's what Jem understands that Scout doesn't. So he's like, like, I don't care about like getting whipped or any of that. And he's like, I, I can't disappoint Atticus. We shouldn't have done that. It was wrong. I have to fix it myself. And that shows that maturity in Jem that Scout doesn't have yet. End of chapter six. See you for seven.